so in the past couple of weeks, uh, folks have asked me about, like, so why did God choose the Jews? And I thought it would be a really appropriate topic to talk about um, in light of issues of racism and crazy things going on in our world. Um, and it's going to take two, three, maybe even four weeks or so to do this. Uh, today I want to get a little background and I, I want to go through some of the uh, secular history of Israel uh, so you can see how God's promises will always come to fruition. And God has chosen uh, his people uh, to bless them if they're holy and to curse or diminish them if they're not holy. Uh, the word for curse was actually used of the floodwaters receding or diminishing from the land. And uh, normally we think of cursing, you know, bring some imprecation like, you know, may the fleas of a thousand camels invest your armpits or, you know, some old hour of curse like that. But it, it's really about diminishing from blessing. And hopefully I'll get to the end of this, which is this sheet today. Um, God says, hey, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Uh, choose life that you may live. And living is really exercising dominion, uh, rulership, being a preeminent uh, over someone else. And uh, cursing is death. It's being deprived of dominion. And, and this applies to both uh, Christians and Jews. Um, some people think, well, I'm Jewish, so uh, it's all good. Um, but God specifically addresses that. It's on this sheet today. And a lot of Christians think, oh, I trusted Jesus, so it's all good. And uh, yeah, you're never going to go into the lake of fire, but it's not all good. Uh, and that, that's a message that is totally lacking in most of the sermons and devotionals and books that I come across. So I, I, I want to kind of do this series to encourage you to believe and trust God and live uh, doing what's right in his sight because it's got consequences. Uh, we just finished a series on Proverbs, and one of the big lessons of Proverbs is there are consequences. And one of the big things that Satan tries to do is tell you there are no consequences. So uh, why were the Jews chosen? Uh, OK, so here's a line that you have to listen to the whole line. The Jews were not chosen. One guy named Abram was chosen and his descendants. Okay, now if you're going to quote me, you have to quote that whole sentence. Uh, and he chose them for blessing. So I'm going to go back and give you some big picture stuff. I don't have, I've got all the details about the scriptures together, uh, all the details about their history. I've, I've gathered stuff, I've read lots of stuff over the years. I filed it away in my brain. And I don't have all the sources and a lot of the stuff, I. I you know, I tried going back and finding it, and he says, it really doesn't make that much difference. You're, you're going to see the big picture. It should become incredibly obvious um, if you pay attention to it. So th there's a background to all this, and uh, I'm going to go all the way back to uh, the flood. So the background is God was grieved with humanity's sinfulness and their idolatry, uh, worshiping someone other than their creator. So uh, he kind of gave up on dealing with groups of people and started over by choosing one man, uh, a sterile 75-year-old named Abram uh, with an equally infertile wife. And he chose them to be separate or distinct from all else. And then because it was going to be seen that Yahweh was Abram's God, when he got blessed, other people in the world would see that God was blessing Abram and wanted to kind of worship God as he worshiped. And through Abram, God's intent was not just to bless his descendants, but to bless the entire world. So a little background in ancient Near Eastern um, religion, and this goes on around the world today, you worship the gods primarily for blessing specifically fertility. If you don't have crops that are fertile, you starve. You just can't go you know, to a local grocery store or, or get it delivered. Um, and if your herds didn't have fertility, uh, you didn't prosper. If your family didn't have fertility, you didn't prosper. Who's going to take care of you? you know, who's going to help you fight your enemies? It's just like, So the whole idea was you worship the gods for fertility and uh, 
you go on to Genesis 22 on Daily Truth Base, I describe a little bit about pagan worship and how they did that. Um, so God takes an infertile guy, who's as good as dead, we're told later in the scriptures, and decides to, out of him, who's as good as dead, make a nation, and then make that the preeminent nation. And at one point under Solomon, you know, Queen of Sheba is coming from Africa because he's heard so much about him. And God would only bless Israel if they obeyed, and he promised to do that. But he's the God who keeps covenant. The word for covenant, it, uh, one of the words that relates to making covenant is called hesed. And it's covenantal loyalty. And all your English translations, is, there might be a few that have changed it a little bit, uh, basically translate that as love and loving kindness. And they fail to realize that God does not indiscriminately choose to love someone regardless. He loves them on the basis of a covenant, and he keeps his promises on the basis of a covenant. And he blesses according to the covenant, and he curses according to the covenant. And that is still in effect in the New Testament times, and will be in effect in the future in the Millennial Kingdom. That might be the last one uh, at the end of the series that I do, depending on how time works out. So he chose one man. So let's go back to Genesis 6. And he chose another man back then. Uh, the Lord looks out uh, at the world. And whenever you see capital L-O-R-D in most of your translations, it's uh, the name, it's Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. -H. And because the Jews didn't want to say his name, lest they take it in vain, and it's totally off base on that uh, one of these days. I actually already have sermons on that. Uh, they, they put what was read, the vowels underneath, were the words for Adonai. So the radicals or consonants are Yahweh, the, rad, the vowels are from Adonai, and that creates the hybrid name, which is in, never in scripture, uh, as intended, for Jehovah. But really, his name is, we say Alelu Yah, that's Yah is Lord at the end. Okay, so Yahweh, Lord, was sorry that he made man. He was grieved in his heart. So he decides to destroy him with the flood. But Noah, one guy, found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, there's some, oh, my, my kindest term for them is stupid people who say, oh, it's grace, so God just said, chose them out of grace. No, he found favor because Noah was a obedient to what God was revealing. Maybe the only guy on earth, probably. Otherwise, he would have been unjust to do what he did. How do I know Noah was uh, obedient? Just look at what follows. He builds an ark in his front yard, <laughs> despite all the ridicule of his neighbor for, I don't know, it took him 100 years? I forget how many years it took him. And, Noah, what you doing? Build, building an ark. What's an ark? Oh, it's kind of a boat. What do you need that for? Well, there's a flood coming. What's a flood? You know, it's like, <laughs> uh, poor Noah. It's, so anyway, you, you all know the flood story. And uh, then God said, okay, no more floods, uh, but I am going to destroy the, melt the world, world in the future. So, you know. You won't drown, but you will burn. Um, then God, uh, when he made Adam, said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And uh, after Noah, he repeats the same thing. Fill the earth, be fruitful, multiply, spread out. We get to Genesis chapter 11, and we see the people saying, and this is really under demonic influence, and I'll tell you why in a second, let us build ourselves, for ourselves, a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered. So they are rebelling against God's command. They are also following Satan's model. In rebelling, trying to make a name for himself, I will ascend to the Most High. And basically this idea of the tower whose top in the, is in the heavens, we kind of want to get back to heaven. It's been the goal of all the demons. Egyptian pyramids, Aztec, uh, mirroring of the constellations, this, all this stuff that kind of points to highly advanced technology, um, basically trying to create heaven on earth. Uh, this is still with us today. Um, I heard somebody who filled in for Ben Shapiro say, you know, the problem is really theological. I mentioned this in a previous sermon, according to some Catholic bishop um, who I think had his act together. And it's like the... Uh, more conservatives recognize that we are fallen people, and uh, our, our world here is never going to be perfect. We will try to make it better as we can, uh, create you know, structures that solve injustice. Uh, 
the more liberal view is, yeah, we're going to make everything wonderful and we're going to bring heaven back on earth. Trouble is, we have to kill everybody who disagrees with us to make that happen. Then when we're in power, everything will be wonderful. Reference North Korea, Russia, China, and you'll see it's never been wonderful. As I mentioned before, more people have died under communism than all the wars in recorded history. So the communist governments, Marxist governments, have killed more of their own people, not, not others, but their own people than every other act of aggression. So they are trying to make a name for themselves. Guy comes down. I, I kind of love the way the text puts it. I, I had to excise a lot of text. Uh, you can find the original. Um, but God looks down to see what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll go take a stroll on Earth by today. Yeah, what is look at the tower? And then he realizes what they're doing. Yeah, obviously, he knows what they're doing. He's omniscient. So the Lord confused the language of all the Earth because basically he says, you know, with their unity, they, they would be able to accomplish their objectives. And uh, from there, the Lord scattered these uh, all these people abroad over the face of the Earth. And theologians refer to this as the table of nations because it talks about where all the nations basically came from. Sorry, the scattered came from, that's what he told after the flood, right? That was his This is after the flood to, to go to fill the earth. Yeah. And they're saying, no, we don't want to get scattered. So they were settled on some plain, they stayed together, they were disobeying God. All right, so it's like clear rebellion. Don't eat the fruit, they rebelled. Scatter and fill, they rebelled. So, you know, it's, that's kind of our fallen nature and our susceptibility to Satan. Uh, um, all right. So God narrows it down to one guy. And uh, a guy called Abram, which means uh, father of the high places, which means high places were desolate, there was nothing. And then eventually he makes him father of many nations, changes his name to Abraham. So he says to him, uh, Abe, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house. We find out that Tara was an idolater, all those people were idolaters. We're not really told why God chose Abram, but once again, um, a guy who responded to God. One individual, as good as said, God chose to bless the entire world. And he says, uh, get out from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Um, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make out of you a great nation. I'm going to bless you and make your name great. Contradistinction to the people in chapter 11 who wanted to make a name for themselves. Here God is going to make a name for Abram. And now he's called the father of faith of you know, all, all those who believe. And you shall be a blessing. His purpose wasn't just to bless him, but to through him bless others. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, Abe, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And Abe, at the age of 75, departs as the Lord had spoken. Just imagine the conversation when he came home that day. Uh, Sarah, we're going to move. Okay, we're going to move, Abram? <laughs> yeah, uh, i got to pack up and you know get out of here. Uh, where are we going to go, Abram? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Just, you know, let's load up the camels and go. Uh, Abram, have you been drinking again? <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a book from uh, Genesis cha uh, Hebrews chapter 11 that I got when I was in college. Uh, one of the campus groups put together a summer survival pack. They bought up a bunch of uh, overstock books, put them together for uh, people to be able to read over the summer. This is the day before, years before video games became a thing. And uh, the title of one of the ones I got, I, I think I read through parts of it, uh, but it was really the title that got me, got, got me. It's the King James Version. It says, not knowing whither. And in he Hebrews it says, and Abraham went out not knowing whither. Didn't know where he was going to go, but he knew that God told him to go. Similarly, when God told him to sacrifice his son Isaac, I, I wish I could do a series on Abraham. It's just, it's, it's fantastic. Um, he basically knew that the voice that told him he was going to have a son was the same voice that told him to sacrifice the son. He also knew that that voice had told him, uh, out of that son, you're going to have uh, multiple nations. And on the way to the mountain, 
chapter 22, I believe. Um, Abraham says to his men, uh, the boy and I will go and worship, and we will return to you. And Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham would give to my reckon, logic, a resurrection. This is before the Easter money. You know, he basically, there was no st story of resurrection. But he figured, God said this, and God said this. He said, uh, I'm going to have descendants. You're going to have descendants through that kid, and now kill the kid. And... He just figured that God would bring him back from the dead if that was what was necessary. He also said at the thing, you know, God, will, when Isaac uh, said, uh, hey, uh, Dad, uh, where's the sacrifice? The Lord will provide. Uh, the Lord has already provided you, but I'm not going to tell you that because, you know, like, I don't want you to freak on the way. <laughs> so you, you can go read the story uh, in the commentary on Daily Truth Base. Okay. He chose Abram to be a blessing and through his descendants to bless the world. And that actually has happened. Uh, you know, you read through the rest of the scriptures, and you know that's that was God's plan. So, backing up to chapter fifteen, I, I got to do two things here. Uh, key verse on faith: uh, God takes Abraham outside one night because every time God shows up, He says, "Oh, look at this land, Abraham! Isn't it great? Look at this great land! This is wonderful land." Yeah, and God says, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, where's my kid?" And uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, nice land, but like I'm not gonna tell it myself. But where's my kid? Um, <laughs> so God says, uh, "Look up at the heavens, Abe. Uh, count the stars if you're able to number them." And Abe's there, like a one, a two, a three, a four, another, 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 and here it's like they didn't have the Arabic number system. It's really hard to count. And then God says, "So shall your descendants be." And Abe. If he was today, he would have said, no way. <laughs> but no, he believed in Yahweh. He believed what God had said. And Yahweh accounted, credited it to him for righteousness. So this is a verse that's used in the uh, New Testament as well. And it's used in modern Christianity that says, oh, you got to believe in Jesus. Well, no, it says you got to believe what God has revealed. And yeah, God has revealed Jesus, but righteousness is doing what's right in God's sight. We need to learn to look at our lives how God sees them, which is why, you know, that's very related to fear of the Lord. And yeah, God has revealed the Jesus the Messiah, and you need to trust in him for your forgiveness of your sins. But it's also revealed you got to love him and obey him if you want to get blessed by him, and that is totally missed. Okay probably you know, 10 guys on the planet, maybe more, uh, that understand that. You, you believe in Jesus to get your sins forgiven so you don't go into the lake of fire, and then you believe that Jesus is coming back to judge you, so you live in light of that future judgment, and that judgment is good or bad. You can gain an inheritance just like the Jews did, or you can lose your inheritance just like the Jews did. It's the same God through both Testaments, um, the same requirement of faith in both Testaments and the same requirements of belief in both Testaments. And the reason you don't hear this is because only 10% of the people who actually teach this stuff have read the entire book. And when they read it, they're just trying to get through to the next chapter <laughs> and they don't understand it. Uh, I had a great time today, I mean this, this week, uh, listening to and reading Deuteronomy. It is a phenomenal book. If just people would understand that and understand how it reflects the nature of God and God's requirements, uh, our world would be a better and you know, far better place. So in, later in chapter 15, um, he makes a covenant with Abraham. And it's called a unilateral covenant. That means only one unilateral side makes the covenant. For this covenant to be fulfilled, it is only dependent upon God's um, strength, power, promise forgiveness. But, you know, it's all, all on God. In order to get blessed in this land, it's a bilateral covenant. That's what the book of Deuteronomy is. It's a covenant renewal document. I'll tell you all about it on Daily Truth Base. And it says, if you obey me, I will bless you. And like chapter 29 has got, you know, page and a half of blessings. And if you disobey me, I will curse you. And it's got like two or three pages of, depending on your Bible, of cursings. 
That's the one that's in effect. But this one is about the land. So what Abraham did is he you know, sacrificed some animals and lays them on the ground. And the way you'd make a covenant in those days, actually the word to cut a covenant actually comes from that. You cut the animals, you put them apart, you joined hands with the other party, you walked between the animals and said, may what happened to these animals happen to us, or something like that, it was probably in Hebrew or Arabic or whatever, uh, if we ever violate the terms of this covenant. Now, when God says these words, Abe is asleep under the tree. He doesn't walk through the animals. God does in the presence of a ball of fire. How does he know that? Well, God recorded by Moses. God gave him that. Maybe Pete opened up an eye. What's going on over there? Um, and the fulfillment of this is totally dependent on God, and it's never going to change. Know certainly that your descendants, that would be the Jews, will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, that would be Egypt, and will serve them as eventually their slaves, and the Egyptians are going to afflict them for 400 years. With, you know, the first few you know, hundred years were good under Joseph because you know, God did great things there, and then a Pharaoh rose who didn't know Joseph, and things got really bad, and you know, eventually God makes things so bad the uh, Israelites cry out for protection. What God is doing there in that land is he is building the Jewish nation, a couple million people. Now, the, the way things worked is you had coalitions of tribes, they call them little kingdoms, and if anyone got too big, the others would gang up on them and attack them to make them smaller. God made it so that because of Joseph's prophecy and his planning and Pharaoh's listening to Joseph, Israel became the preeminent nation on the earth. They bought up all the gold and then all the land. They owned the land. It's like this, you know, uh, Pharaoh, or Pharaoh official, we need food. Okay, uh, give me your silver and gold and I'll give it to you. Uh, we already did that last year. But what do you got? We'll give you our land. Okay, I'll take your land because what, what good does our land do us if we're dead? So they owned all the land. They were the preeminent power and nobody was going to attack Egypt. A little sidebar here. Um, Israel grows up to be this nation in the cradle of Egypt and nobody attacks Egypt but after Israel left Egypt the Hiskas, they're kind of uh, horse raiders from the north comes down and basically takes all of his Egypt stuff where's this mighty army? where's the most famous military power? They're sleeping with the fishes. Read about it in Daily Truth Base. Okay, so they'll serve them and afflict them for 40 years. And the nation whom they serve, I will judge. And afterward, they'll come out with many great possessions. So if you know, this, you know what happens in Exodus, God says, ask the Egyptians for gold. And God spoils the Egyptians because the Egyptians hadn't given them wages. They get all those wages. And what are they supposed to do with all this gold they got in the middle of the desert? There aren't places to spend it. They actually give it to uh, Moses uh, to build the tabernacle, and you know, basically it's God freed us, and we give back to him. They came out with great possessions. Uh, in the fourth generation, uh, they shall return here, and here's the line that most people don't understand. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. What's that got to do with anything? Well. Okay, you have to read all the other stuff, a bunch of verses, and there's no room for them. And, you know, it would take me forever to kind of pull them all together. I probably uh, reference some of it on Daily Truth Base. But the idea is that each of these nations had a demon god ruling over them. So I, I did a survey of, I used to teach a course on world cultures, and I looked at how they arose. And almost all of them have some sort of god giving the law and instructions to the king and the king would always credit this god with their victory. And it really, every battle was a battle of the gods. Oh no, their god is stronger than our god. Run for the hills. Um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of the way it worked. They were idolaters. And they yeah, would do evil things like sacrifice their children, um, you know, burn them in fire, uh, oppress other people, really cruel stuff. And uh, God wanted to cleanse, judge them and cleanse the land. But he gives the Amorites 
400 years to repent. We're not told to be ever sent them a prophet, but in his infinite justice, God holds people accountable for the revelation that they've been given, even if they don't want to listen to it. And uh, he waits and then eventually brings this nation of Jews out of Egypt. Um, he has to get rid of that, you know, the whole first generation because they rebelled against the Kadesh Barnier, Numbers 13, 14, daily truth base. And then uh, this next generation he brings to the brink of the promised land, and that's where the book of Deuteronomy takes place. And he, he basically it follows a covenant renewal document. He says, I've been really good to you guys. You guys have been really bad to me. You broke release multiple times. You trashed the whole place. Uh, I'm going to forgive you, and we're going to reestablish this covenant. And people say, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll do it, just like they said the first time. And then they didn't, and I, I've got some verses of Deuteronomy on here. But really, if you have never read Deuteronomy, you know, read it, and read it with Daily Truth Base. It'll uh, make some of the obscure stuff a little uh, less uh, obtuse. So God is going to use Israel to judge the nations that have rebelled against him. But wait, there's more. He then raises up the uh, Assyrians, a fierce tribe from the north, to judge the northern tribes of Israel for their disobedience and rebellion. And then a bunch of years pass, and you know, the, the good guys from the north, as many few of they, that there were, came down to the southern two tribes, so Judah and Benjamin. And then Judah and Benjamin sees what happens to the ten tribes of the north, doesn't repent. And then God raises up the Babylonians to judge Israel. And the thing that is just heartbreaking, you read through Jeremiah. Man, Jeremiah is another great book that people don't pay attention to. And you see how gracious God has been to the Jews, how they repeatedly reject the revelation. They, they stone his prophets, kill them, or not Jeremiah, they, they abuse Jeremiah. And then God has the Babylonians come in and burn to the ground the most magnificent temple that was on earth, that was housing his glory. And he could not tolerate the idolatry of uh, Israel. And why would Israel rebel against this God that in their history has delivered them from Egypt, has given them this promised land, has fought their battles? I can only attribute it to demonic influence, that they were seduced to worship the evil gods through their you know, sensuality and other things. And in the Millennial Kingdom, there's going to be peace because Satan is going to be bound. But when he's released, they rebel again. You have a choice as to whether you serve God or rebel against God. Satan will always entice you to rebel against him. Um, but God has given us his word, major thing, as a defense against that, and you know, guard our minds that this is what's going to happen. On that same day, verse 18, Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given, I think this is have, let me make sure I got that verb tense there. Um... Yep, I have given this land from the river of Egypt, that would be the Nile, to the great river Euphrates, the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. As you go from Egypt east, first one you hit is Euphrates, I remember this for ET, uh, and that's somewhere in the middle of uh, Iraq, yeah, Iraq comes first, and then Iraq, and then Iran. Um, so, I used to teach this in my Western Civ course, so I needed something to help my students remember as well as me. Um, so, uh, boy, I want to go to, the, I'm going to show you what that might look like on the maps, and we're going to do a whole bunch of maps in a minute, but I'll wait till I get to that point. As they're standing at the brink of the Jordan River, this is the next generation in the book of Deuteronomy, and just like he part of the Red Sea, um, for the first generation, he's going to part the Jordan River in, in the next book, which is Joshua. But first, he reiterates this covenant. People agree to obey. And he says in Deuteronomy 8, 1, 8, See, look at it. I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This phrase comes out repeatedly. And you go back and you look at the accounts of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he reappears to Isaac and he reappears to Jacob and reiterates the covenant. These are known as the, the forefathers, the patriarchs, 
These are the ones to whom God made this covenant. The covenant is to them who are obeying God, going out, not knowing whither, looking for a city whose had foundations, whose builder and maker is God, according to Hebrews 11. And to give to the patriarchs and their descendants after them the land. The descendants are the ones who are blessed by this unconditional covenant. It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Jews came from them. And look, the Lord your God has multiplied you as the stars of heaven in multitude. That ring any bells? Yeah, chapter 15, verse 5. Count those stars, Abe. Then may the Lord God of your fathers. Okay, it, it, this goes back to the root of a blessing. We're going to look at this in the very bottom of this page, which I probably won't get to until next week. Um, the Jews are grafted, are, are this olive tree. Gentiles, modern day Christians, are grafted into that root that has, that's where all the blessings come from. I'm going to make you a thousand times more numerous than you are and bless you as he has promised you. So God has promised to bless. It's on the basis of the promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, be, despite their disobedience, because th there's no way the Jews wrote the Old Testament. No way they forged it. Because it presents <laughs> a really horrible, horrible picture of people who are ungrateful, they don't reciprocate, they're just not nice people. Um, the essence of a relationship is reciprocity. God does something good for you. You do something good for God. God says, do this. You're supposed to do that. You don't do it. You, you've broken the covenant. And that, you know, that's a, still a thing. That it used, well, I'm not sure if it's still a thing, but it used to be still a thing in the ancient Near East. But despite their disobedience, despite their rebellion, despite God having to bring upon them all the curses that he promised in Deuteronomy 29, 30, somewhere in there, um, he, he preserves Israel. His purposes to bless are not thwarted by their disobedience. So just read through 9, 10, and 11. I actually quote something from 11 that says, hey, when the Jews stop rebelling, they're going to get grafted back into the promises. And you Gentiles, by the way, you, you, only, you, you are sharing in Israel's blessing only because of your faith and your obedience. And if you don't Continue in those things, you're going to get broken off just like the Jews got broken off. And not all Jews were broken off. The passage says some. I realized after I uh, got the outline printed, uh, yeah, I probably should have put that word some back in there. It didn't fit on the line. But it's some of the Jews, actually, early church was all Jews. They, they, they accepted the Messiah. Um, but, you know, when they're going to accept him again, um, they're getting, you know, things are getting, when things get worse and worse, they will call out. Book of Amos, uh, an Old Testament minor prophet, says, Hear this word Yahweh has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt. So this is like, uh, uh, you know, after they're in the land, they conquered their enemies, and now they're being bad again. You only I have known of all the families on the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Remember, he was punishing the... Um, Amorites for their iniquities. God always punishes iniquities, okay? He doesn't stop being uh, just in order to love you. He loves, he, his justice and love are, you know, equally part of his character. So, uh, it, it really, as I was looking at some of the stuff in the history of Israel, my mind kept going back to the book of Esther. The book of Esther does not mention God's name. So it's actually had a hard time getting included in, you know, that's the book of the Bible. There's, how can it be a book of the Bible? It doesn't mention God. Um, but when I was doing some research on Free Daily Truth Faiths, uh, I, I came across, I think it might have been Bulliger or what, who kind of was one of the few guys they let see the uh, Masoretic texts. And he noticed in the margin that the scribes had found God's name mentioned maybe four times. It's an acrostics. It's back, you know, it's just the way it was written and emphasized. It... Yahweh is there, but he said, I will turn my face from you if you disobey me. And he did. Yet, when, when um, was it Mordecai was going to wipe out, oh, no, that's a good guy. Uh, who's uh, Mordecai's the uncle? Haman was going to, thank you, knock out all the, uh, exterminate the Jews. God 
steps in and still saves his people. Uh, I don't know if you know the story, but uh, the night before that was supposed to happen, the king couldn't sleep. Uh, so, oh, bring me history. Let me read it to me. <laughs> the Chronicles. History puts a lot of people to sleep, uh, particularly in my classes. And the it, it gives an account of where uh, Mordecai saved the king's life, or something, something like that. And God says, uh, the king says, so what has been done for him? How would we honor him? Uh, anyway, so, so God uses like these odd circumstances to still protect his people. He's not directly intervening with hail from heaven or lightning or the earth swallowing up or you know other things like that. But he uses some other means. We're going to see those in about two minutes. So uh, I'm going to take you to look at uh, six days of Israel. But before okay, I do that, can you, can you just back to you said there's no way the Jews wrote the Old Testament. Can you? Can you just identify like what what that's in response to? Is it like people usually say they just made it up? Or oh yeah, like people that? say that they just made it up and it's not reliable. Um, and the Jews just made this fable so they could have the, the promised land. But we're we're going to see some ancient maps of where Israel, you know, archaeologically, you can dig and find out that the Jews are there. Um, the, the Jews come across really poorly in the Old Testament. They're ungrateful. They're disloyal. Uh, they're stupid. You know, it's like, how can you be so stupid to continually rebel when you see, you know, the consequences right in front of your face? Um, you know, and, and there are times when the Jews obeyed and then it went well with them. And then there are times they disobeyed and they failed to keep, you know, teach your kids these things. You know, it's just, you wouldn't write this. About yourself. About yourself. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it gives in some excruciating detail uh, some of the, you know, horrible things like the end of Judges. Uh, there is actually a little bit of an attempt at whitewashing, and it really isn't whitewashing. It's still all true, but they just kind of omitted a few things. First and Second Chronicles, after the exile, covers the same ground as uh, Kings. And it leaves out a uh, little thing about David and Bathsheba. Um, and, you know, because their purpose in writing it, or God's Spirit, is he wants to encourage the people to realize, yeah, God's good. He doesn't want to, you know, they're, they're in exile. They're, 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 they're basically have lost hope. They're really repenting over their sin. So he gives them hope through showing them more of the good stuff. If you want the bad stuff, you go back in Kings and you realize how bad they are. Um, so we're going to look at some maps uh, that, uh, yeah, they come from the Israeli government, but uh, they are, um, you can go verify them in other sources. And then we're going to look at uh, a little bit about the Six Day War, uh, which is fantastic. But I, I want to show you why part of why God has preserved Israel is not just, you know, because of the promises made, but he's got a plan to bless the world through them, and that is going to happen. And Romans 11 tells us that through the um, Jews' failure, uh, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And, you know, that, and it looks forward to the time when Israel will repent, and then that's going to be like light from the dead. It's going to be fantastic. But back in chapter 9, uh, we've got this place where Paul is wishing he was, uh, the, the word says accursed. And, and really, it, the, the major meaning of the word is you dedicated something to the temple, and it couldn't be used for anything else. And Paul wishes that he was being sent to the Israelites, who were his kinsmen, rather than to the Gentiles. So here he is, this uber Jew, very, very zealous, and they give Peter the job of going to uh, the Jews when okay. Paul wants to go to the Jews. So then when you get to chapter 11, you've got to read 9, 10, and 11, okay? It all goes together before you, you know, form your judgments and incorrect beliefs on partial information. Um, he says, I'm going to magnify my ministry to the Gentiles to try to make the Jews jealous. And if the Gentiles, I guess that includes us, and the Messianic Jews were obeying, then God would be able to bless us more and Jews would uh, want to have a relationship with God. You're going to see that God actually uses Gentile Christians to save the Jewish nation. It's coming up real soon, like in 10 minutes. So he says, my brethren, are, the kinsmen are the Israelites, and here's some of the things that they've got. They've got the adoption as sons, where God has basically said, I'm your God, you're my people, and as that, they're his heirs. Theirs is the glory. The glory of God was manifested in the wilderness uh, over the tabernacle, uh, cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. It was manifested in the um, temple 
uh, the glory was seen over the temple in Jerusalem, and uh, uh, as Ezekiel sees it departing, um, it was, was seen in Christ doing his miracles and redeeming man in Jerusalem. Um, it's going to be seen when it, the Lord returns in his glory, and he's, you know, basically his headquarters is going to be Jerusalem. Uh, the Jews are the ones to whom God made these covenants. He didn't make them with any other nation. Uh, they're the ones who got the giving of the law, and there's a lot of spot where people are going to grab hold of Jews in the future and say, tell us about your law. God is with you. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, theirs is the service of God. Uh, that's like the whole temple service. That's what it's referring to. Uh, theirs are the promises, the promises of the millennial kingdom, the new covenant. They're the ones who got that. The Messiah comes from them. Of whom are the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and from whom, according to the flesh, you know, the human descent, Christ came, the Messiah came, who is over all, who is the eternally blessed God. Who's that? The Messiah. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word that was God became flesh and dwelt among us for a time and beheld his glory full of grace and truth. It's John 1. Okay, so now... Lord willing, what's my next point? Yeah, um, it's this one. I'm not going to get back to this. Well, I might. Individual Christians and Jews are only blessed, i.e. live, if they are righteous and loyal to God. Otherwise, they are cursed or die. They lose dominion. So he says at the end of Deuteronomy, okay, folks, I set before you good and uh, life and death, good and evil. So life is equated with good, death is equated with evil. And I command you to love Yahweh your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments. Notice those are two things. It's not just legalistic keeping the commandments, but walk according to the ways he wants you to walk, that you may live and have life and multiply. Um, so, oh yeah, this is a great chapter. Uh, I don't want to get into it because I'll never get to the main maps. Okay, so let's see if I can get to these sites without... With this. So I asked Great Google for a map of the land. Uh, let's say, map of the land God promised Israel. And I got all these different maps. <laughs> um, some of them go up as far as Turkey, down to the Nile, includes the Sinai Peninsula, all the way down through here. Uh, some of them just go more literally, okay, from the river over through the Red Sea to this. This is the Euphrates and this is. Uh, the Tigris, and they go up to Turkey. Uh, that's where some of them go. So you've got a number of different, this is the classic map of Israel uh, under uh, the 12 tribes, one of these things, which is pretty close to the modern one. Uh, some people just draw a line here, some go here. Okay, so it's a, it's a territory that's bigger, actually, than Israel has ever possessed, which tells you, for God to be true and his promises to be kept, you need to have the Jews take over that land. Now, one of God's promises is going to fail. So, that points to the fact that there is a future millennial kingdom in which God reigns over Israel through at Jerusalem and all the nations of the world uh, acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Well, here's one of the tribes of Israel. So, notice they, they covered this side of the, this is the Jordan River. Right up and down the bottom. So, Israel in modern maps is only this side area. Uh, this whole section we're going to see is, I think, the West Bank. It's the West Bank of the Jordan River. Uh, Gaza is this little section down here somewhere. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll draw a big map and we'll see it. So let's go here. This is actually, a, I don't think this is a biased map at all. Um, so <laughs> these are the nations around Israel that are Arab, and this little sliver of blue. Is Israel. Wow. This is a tiny little bit. God doesn't need a whole lot of territory. That's what he's going to do. Um, I can't. Yeah, this is like, wow. So we, this is not the map I want to show you. I want to go down here. Uh, great maps on contemporary Israel, but I want to show you in here. Um, so the traditional 12 tribes, this is uh, Exodus was about 1500 uh, BC. Around 1200, after they kind of consolidated power, you can read all about it. There they are. Okay, so uh, 
There's the Gaza Strip uh, over here. Uh, this was David's stronghold. Um, and th this is the Sinai Peninsula all the way down to here. So it was the blockade of, the, this was their only port to, to the uh, Asia. And uh, Egypt blockaded it uh, against UN Convention and everything else. You have a couple tribes, they call the Transjordan, you know, uh, Gad, Rubin, Manasseh. Um, and you go up just to Tyre. Jesus actually was kind of, you didn't, instead, I think he even got somewhere up near there. Okay, so you, you see where the territory is. The Jews occupied it. And archaeology tells you that. Um, then under Solomon, it gets bigger. You, know, you don't need to show you that. Uh, under Herod, this is under Roman um, rule over Israel, they actually extended it pretty far to the west. I mean east, my bad. Um, and they got a little more south. So that's, uh, archaeology will confirm that. Um, let me get back to my other one. Where'd it go? Okay. Then at 70 AD, common era, what they call it, uh, the temple got destroyed and the Jews dispersed. So up until 636, we have a, we're going to have a map. Uh, Muhammad was like, I think, 750. So the, the United, even a, you know, Islam is not a thing yet. Um, and look at all this says, we go all the way down here, um, Jewish communities, okay? Jewish communities. All these on both sides, uh, 600 years after Christ, look at all these Jewish communities. And you can go, they've dug these up and there's evidence of the Jews having lived there. And Stars of David and all kinds of other stuff. Um, where is Jerusalem? Jerusalem should be somewhere up, oh, somewhere down here. There it is. I think that's it. No, it's probably not. Uh, I have to follow it up. But Jerusalem is somewhere down there. But you know, it's a pretty obvious Jewish presence in the land, even after they have been scattered. Okay. So let's go so back. They possessed the land at this point. They were just living in. Land. They're living in land under. You know, it could be a, a caliphate a rule of the Arabs at that point. There's um, then after Islam up until there, they are still presence in the land, um, inhabited by Jews during the period of Arab rule from uh, 600 to probably 1200. Suleiman might be near the end of that, um, and they. Here's Jerusalem right there. Uh, they're still in there, even though they are constantly being oppressed by the Jews. These are Jew I mean, by the Arabs, they're still Jewish communities. Okay, then we're going to go right up to, I guess, World War One. The Zionist movement, uh, it's actually increased a bit. Those are the Jewish communities. The red is ones that are Jewish Arab communities. Okay, so it's, uh, it's mainly centered up there. Let's go cross that one out. We'll lose it and go back. All right. Then you've got um, Lord Balfour. Um, basically is establishing a, a national home for the Jewish people since 1917. And they give them a pretty decent amount of land. But it doesn't always last. Um, well, all the blue. Yeah, the, all the blue. Yeah. All that blue. That's, yeah. Let's go up here and see what the legend says. The British mandate said the Jews should have this. And the the black line is contemporary Israel, so this this, this darker outline right here is where contemporary Israel is. Is that close to what the Promised Land was supposed to be? Uh, well, this thing it's it's might get up to a part of Iraq. It doesn't go to the. Uh, I don't think it gets to the Nile. Got it. Well, maybe, but they said that, but they never got it. Then. Um, 
it's through the British mandate. So the British mandate now gives all that back to the red stuff to the Arabs. And this is kind of more like biblical, you know, 12 tribes minus the Transjordan, and very similar to what uh, it's supposed to be today. So the Jews were supposed to be able to live there. Uh, the UN then comes, you can read about the Field Commission yourself, and uh, basically in 1947, Jews, Jews become a nation in 1948, uh, the UN in 1947 votes to do this, and the Jew, the Arabs rejected it. So they took away all that land that the Jews had. They pushed the Jews to the margins here. So this is Gaza Strip. So it's you know all the trouble because the border to Egypt, and you're going to see they always fire rockets from here, and they fire rockets from this, the West Bank and of course the Jordan. Um, and this is supposed to be international rule, but the Jews still have had this land. So the Jews have had a continuous presence there, even under Arab rule and oppression, but they just took away all the land that the Jews had. Bad you land. Yeah, well, we knew that. Okay, then we Why? have... What? Why? Political. You have to realize that the scriptures indicate that the Prince of Persia the, the principalities and powers of the air are demonic forces that hate God's people, right? And I look at what's happening in my country now, and it's the same kind of craziness, um, where people are destroying things that are giving a bless, blessing. Why do they want to exterminate the Jews? The Jews have suffered more oppression than any other nation on earth. You never hear of the Hittites being oppressed. You know, there are no Hittites. You know, the Assyrians, they're gone. Um, you know, Christians, yeah, Christians are really oppressed a whole lot too. But the Jews have been oppressed like since uh, they won. Uh, you know, at least uh, 14, 15 plus 9, 1900 uh, BC. God called Abraham, there was opposition uh, all the way there. Okay, so. Uh, the, the Brits are now going to withdraw from Israel, and Israel is going to declare their independence. Now, this is the information that I, I couldn't dig up. Uh, under the British mandate, it was illegal for a Jew to carry more than two cartridges for his rifle when he was out hunting, and it was punishable by a year or something in prison. Okay. So Jews did not have much of anything, okay? Let me show you what happened. No army. They declare that they are a nation. And some people start attacking them. We got Lebanon going to come down and attack them. Syria is going to attack them. Iraq is going to attack them. Jordan is going to attack them. Um, you get some people from Saudi Arabia coming over and attack them. Egypt comes and attacks them. I don't know who that green, this green, what it, this green flag is. Um, major Arab attacks from outside Israel. You're an infant nation, and everyone around you that has much more territory, many more people, want to wipe you off the face of the earth. What did you do wrong? You exist. So, what? One of the things I had read is um, there were there was a brethren Christian where the brethren roots assembly, and uh, he would smuggle arms down from Germany, fly down to equip the Jews. There was another Christian that was a military genius kind of guy that trained their troops. The Jews here are basically farmers, okay? They have, set, they have set up agriculture, and their agriculture, someone said, you know, they're always firing ro rockets into Israel. You're, you're going to see it's an amazing thing that they're, how they do that. Yet the, the Jews are providing like 75% of the fruits and vegetables to the Arab world. <laughs> they're killing their basic source of nutrients. Um, yeah, it, it's just, it doesn't make sense. It's just a hatred for the people because they are God's people. 
uh, they're bright people. You know, they're, they're, they're the ones who develop the uh, ac uh, hydroponics and hy uh, aquaponics that China has come and stolen. So I saw a satellite view of, uh, of someone went through, must have been, you know, an INTP with too much time on his hands. Um, he goes through the satellite views and calculates the food production done from solar power and aquaponics all over China. And China produces so much more food than we do through that. They don't need to buy any food from us. Um, which goes, yeah, it's, it's, they never developed that technology themselves. They've always gotten their technology from stealing it. The Jews by the... <laughs> hey, some of my best friends are Asian. Um, okay, let's go. Hey, you recognize quality. You recognize quality. <laughs> okay, so... Um, where did I... Contemporary Israel, let me get back to... Sorry, I lost my place here. Um, so, the War of Independence, okay. Then they get attacked, they win uh, against all kinds of odds. They had, let's see what this map says. Come on. Yeah. Ah. Let's go down. Um, They give back, uh, I have, there's a map here, where they they basically push these Arab states back. Did I miss that on the previous one? Let's see. No, back. How did they win it? The whole miracle's on it, but I don't have time to get into that. Um, so, I'm going to do the Six Day War. Um, they, they won because they were trained, because God helped them provided the resources. Uh, they were fighting for their lives. Uh, the Arabs just wanted the territory. The Arabs weren't coordinated. So you know, if you look at the, just the secular Israeli view, um, that's what they'd say. But God protecting them, God equipping them ahead of time, God using Christians to bless them, because Christians have been blessed by the Jews. Without the Jews, we wouldn't have Christianity. So. Uh, in 1948, they get their independence. Uh, they conquer a bunch of land, and then they wind up actually giving it back. Uh, I should give you the map on that, but I'm going to run out of time. Then, uh, in 1950, Egypt blockades uh, that thing. Remember I showed you at the bottom? Their only port. They blockade that. It was an act of war. They're all threatening Israel. They're all sworn. They swear themselves to Israel's destruction. Never make peace with Israel. And the, Israel realizes uh, these guys are going to attack us. So, um, map of the military, territory of Israel before the war is colored royal blue. Uh, territories occupied by Israel are green. They go beyond, right up to the Nile. They go to the north. And uh, I'm going to show you how the things stack up. Um, on, one, on our left, and in this corner, weighing in, <laughs> we've got Israel. On the other side, we have Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon. Uh, there are others as well. Um, Israel had 50,000 troops. Egypt had 240,000. They had some reserves. Uh, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq, they had 300,000 troops. Israel's got 50. Uh, Israel had 800 tanks. They've got 2,500 tanks. Uh, Israel has like 250 or 300 combat aircraft. They have almost 1,000 combat aircraft. Israel had the most advanced aircraft and surface-to-air missiles in the entire uh, Middle East. Russia funded most of it. So the total number of troops, um, they, they're outnumbered either the total number or the number that were actually deployed. Casualties? Casualties. Israel lost under 1,000. I know. You, you won't believe this. Uh, they lost 400 of their tanks and 46 of their aircraft. They wiped out the is, uh, Egypt's Air Force. Uh, the, if you add all these up, um, well, how many total destroyed? Uh, you got 15,000 plus, I think it's like, uh, just add these up, and you got a whole bunch of people killed. Um, yeah, so Israel 
It's like 20, you know, maybe 20,000 killed overall. Uh, Israel loses 1,000. Uh, but it was a pretty big percentage of their population compared to all the other world. Okay, so uh, what I want to show you is just, a, I'm going to end on this, this little uh, video. Um, it's from a Jewish, I think, perspective. Okay, so I'll, I'll cut it off when it gets you know, too Jewishy. <laughs> 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 but it, it really is amazing. Uh, this is not from a Christian perspective. Uh, The Muslim nations in the Middle East would not accept Israel's existence since its founding in 1948. They began amassing huge amounts of sophisticated weaponry and lobbying for the implementation of boycotts, divestment, and sanctions against the Jewish state. <laughs> On the 15th of May, 1967, on Israel's Independence Day, a three-week period began, which was one of the most tense and fearful periods in Israel's history. In direct contravention of international agreements, Egyptian leader Jamal Abdel Nasser removed the UN peacekeeping forces and began moving tens of thousands of soldiers and hundreds of tanks into what was the demilitarized Sinai Peninsula towards Israel's southern border. Egypt also blockaded the Straits of Tehran, an open international waterway which was essentially a declaration of war. Israel turned to the nations of the world, primarily to the United States, for assistance against Egyptian aggression, but somehow all Western countries decided to remain neutral. Very quickly it became apparent that the promises were all but forgotten. Israel, with 2.5 million Jews, was left alone to face the might of the Arab nations. Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Lebanon formed a military alliance and began moving forces into Jordan towards Israel's borders. When the Arab countries realized that the world had abandoned Israel, many other Muslim countries were openly calling for the destruction of Israel. The will and means to murder millions of Jews were evident. Top IDF commanders expressed their concerns at the high price Israel was liable to pay in a war with the Arab world. Some military experts projected a toll between 20 and 100,000 lives. Israel prepared cemeteries all over the country, ready to accommodate many expected victims. Massive parks were prepared in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and other cities in case the cemeteries would have no more space. World governments, instead of defending Israel's right to exist, warned Israel continuously not to attack. However, the people of Israel had no choice but to go to war, to defend their country in their very existence. At 7.15 a.m. on June 5th, 1967, the IDF launched Operation Moked, Focus. Almost the entire Israeli Air Force was dispatched in a daring mission. Only 12 planes stayed behind. The risk of this operation was extraordinary, as the fighter pilots flew at an unprecedented low altitude of less than 20 meters above the ground. Egypt had the most advanced ground air missile defense systems in the Middle East. Most of the Israeli jets were old and outdated French planes. If the Israeli jets would have been detected, many would have fallen, and Israel would have been left with practically no air force. And then, a miracle occurred. The most advanced Russian MiG jets that patrolled the airspace along the borders between Egypt and Israel were, for that one critical hour, grounded. Incredibly, at that very same time, the top commanders of Egypt, Jordan, and Iraq flew together to observe the Egyptian forces invading Sinai. The Egyptian officers had ordered all anti-aircraft units not to fire unless given a direct order as long as they were in flight. This created total confusion on the Egyptian ground as Israel struck exactly in that window of time. By 7.45 a.m., the high hand of providence resulted in the Israeli Air Force reaching all the Egyptian airfields without even one plane being detected. More than 200 Egyptian planes, almost half of Egypt's fleets, were almost instantaneously destroyed, also bombing the runways and making impotent the mightiest air force in the Middle East. 
General Moti Hode, commander of the Air Force, said, In my wildest dreams, I never would have conceived of such an incredible success. A second wave of Israeli jets were directed to Cairo to confront the remains of the Egyptian Air Force. And here, another miracle occurred. No less miraculous than the first. Even though Israel had lost the element of surprise and the anti-aircraft systems were operating with full capacity, Egypt was only able to hit one Israeli plane. The Israeli Air Force went on to destroy a total of more than 300 Egyptian planes, and every airfield in Egypt was neutralized. It was nothing less than a military miracle, seemingly impossible. And then, another miracle occurred. It was as if God hardened the heart of the Egyptian president Nasser, who continuously gloated about his glorious military victory over Israel. In the Arab media, President Nasser spoke of the end of Israel's air force and of the Egyptian tanks on their way to Jerusalem. Jordan, Syria, and Iraq believed these bombastic statements and wanted to join in in the great victory against the Jews. All the Arab air power struck simultaneously on multiple fronts. In almost any other scenario, Israel would not have been able to respond as quickly as it did. The timing was seemingly orchestrated to position Israeli jets exactly where they should be. Not in six days, but in six hours, the war was won. A biblical prophecy comes to pass as the forces of Israel sweep on in an astonishing triumph of strategy. After achieving air supremacy, her forces thrust like an avenging sword at the very heart of Arab self-confidence. And then, perhaps, the greatest miracle of all, a miracle Israel never expected, Jerusalem. Again, it seemed as though it was a divine appointment in time. Jerusalem was to be restored to the Jewish people after 2,000 years. The enemies of Israel had twice as many soldiers as we did, three times as many planes, four times as many tanks. The odds were stacked against us on every military front. The love of Israel, self-sacrifice, and courage of the Israeli soldiers, combined with divine guidance and assistance, made these miracles possible. Yitzhak Rabin, then the Minister of Defense, was given the honor of giving the war its name. He chose the Six-Day War, recalling the Six Days of Creation, as Israel too was created with the liberation of Jerusalem. As the center of gravity of the Jewish people has now returned to the land of our fathers, the Torah center of the world has once again returned to Jerusalem. The chief rabbinate of the state of Israel has established the 28th of Iyar, a day of Hallel in Hodaya, praise and thanks for the salvation of our people and the liberation and return of our capital, Jerusalem. Jews in Israel and in every country in which they reside come together in prayer and celebration. Similar to Hanukkah and Purim, it sometimes takes many years for the miracles to be fully recognized and celebrated. The Mizrahi World Movement is involved in massive community-wide celebrations across the globe, from London to Los Angeles, from Melbourne to Johannesburg to Chicago and Toronto. For 2,000 years, our hope never died. Our faith as a people never wavered. Wherever Jews were and whenever they prayed, they prayed facing Jerusalem. Whatever happened the night before, whether it was the Crusades, the Inquisition, Muslim oppression, or Nazis in Germany, the next morning a Jew would wake up, dust himself off, put on his talit, face Jerusalem, and pray to come home, knowing somehow, some way, God would bring us back. This is our greatest celebration to be alive in this generation where the prayers of our fathers and mothers have finally been answered, to be alive and to take part in Jewish destiny, to experience miracles of divine providence by Amim Hahem Basman Hazeh, like in those days, but in our time. So, God watches out for his people. Israel was in this mess because of their disobedience. Um, even though they are not acknowledging the Messiah, 
God is still helping them out. So uh, we'll pick up what they were supposed to be doing next time. Because <laughs> our time is up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you uh, chose to visit and bless uh, your creation and your people. We thank you for choosing the nation of Israel, preserving them through all these years, for showing your graciousness, yet loyalty to your justice and covenant and hesed. Uh, we pray for the Jewish nation that they would uh, go back and look at their history and understand uh, the relationship that you desire with each and every one of them, not just uh, outward ritual, but uh, an inward reality. Uh, we pray for the Christian uh, quote, nation, unquote, that uh, they would also uh, humble themselves and seek your face and you would hear their prayers and heal their land just like you promised to the nation of Israel. Uh, we pray that uh, you would show yourself strong on behalf of those whose heart uh, is perfect toward you and uh, protect uh, and bless your faithful ones. We know that uh, sometimes you let people be martyred. We know that some, uh, eventually uh, they will be rejoicing over the blessings that you give them in the future because this life is not all there is. But may we use it wisely uh, according to your purposes. We give thanks in Christ's name. Amen.